Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Going Solo by Roald Dahl. So this is his second volume of autobiography. The first one is Boy, which follows his childhood. And here in Going Solo, we basically follow him when he joins the RAF during the Second World War. So I'm going to read you the blur before we go any further. Superb stories, daring deeds, fantastic adventures. Going Solo, the second part of Roald Dahl's compelling and colourful autobiography, creates a world as bizarre and unnerving as any you will find in his fiction. A marvellous evocation of his wartime exploits, it tells of African safaris and deadly snakes, of fighter planes and incredible air battles with the enemy during World War II. Told with all the irresistible appeal which has made Roald Dahl one of the world's best loved writers, Going Solo makes a sensational sequel to Boy. And the cover illustration there is by Quentin Blake as well. I don't know, I'm in two minds about this. For a start, I would say, although Dahl is mostly known for his children's books, this feels more geared towards adults to me. There's nothing in it that would disqualify it for a, you know, for a young reader, but um, I think it it touched on more adult themes, I guess. I mean, it is all about the war. That There's quite often it feels as though very little is happening because he's basically in, like, an under an understaff, uh, fleet of RAF planes and so I think there was like 13 of them against a thousand Luftwaffe planes so they were heavily outnumbered and his job was basically to kind of oversee <laughs> as people retreated from Athens in Greece as the Allies retreated and so there's a lot of just sort of waiting around and a lot of moving away from the enemy there are you know his fair share of battles as well but I don't know I just didn't find it particularly interesting and that's a shame because I do really, I do find the war fascinating. I think because it was just this sort of, just, it was just Dahl's war. It didn't really feel as though it tied in with the rest of the Second World War and what I know about that, you know. What I, what I did enjoy was that every now and then there were photos. So, for example, there's, you know, just like this one here. Oh, let me, let me show you the one of him in his uniform. Here he is in his uniform. So the photos are great, but that kind of contrasted with, there were a lot of letters that he wrote as well. And quite often that led to a part in the formatting where, you know, the book, you'd have to turn the page to finish your paragraph and then flick back to finish reading the letter, which was kind of annoying. Oh, now let me check out a few of the things I marked out. He's talking about some of the snakes he experienced. He says, we used often to see a big one gliding across the dirt road ahead of the car. And the golden rule was never to accelerate and try to run it over, especially if the roof of the car was open, as ours often was. If you hit a snake at speed, the front wheel can flip it up into the air and there is a danger of it landing in your lap. I can think of nothing worse than that. The postman's here. wonder if he has anything for me. We have this bit here as well, which is, this one is for you Lion King fans out there. Suddenly the voice of a man yelling in Swahili exploded into the quiet of the evening. It was my boy, Ndisho. Buana, 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 he was yelling from somewhere behind the house. Simba, Buana, Simba, Simba. Simba is Swahili for lion. All three of us leapt to our feet, and the next moment Mdisho came tearing round the corner of the house, yelling at us in Swahili. Come quick, Buana! Come quick! Come quick! A huge lion is eating the wife of the cook! He says, that sounds pretty funny when you put it on paper back here in England, but to us, standing on a veranda in the middle of East Africa, it was not funny at all. Do you have Mdisho here? He's, um... They're talking about the war. And, uh, Mdisho says, when is this enormous war going to begin? They say quite soon, I told him, because over in Europe, which is ten times as far away as from here to Kilimanjaro, the Germans have a leader called Buana Hitler who wishes to conquer the world. The Germans think this Buana Hitler is a wonderful fellow, but he is actually a raving mad maniac. As soon as the war begins, the Germani will try to kill us all, and then, of course, we shall have to try to kill them before they can kill us. They have this awkward moment as well where, because they're in Africa, and it's kind of English owned or whatever, so they have to round up all of the Germans in this... The, the area they're living with because they don't want them to get back to Germany and join the army. I can't seem to find exactly where it was, but um, this um, the uh, the boy, his boy, goes over and he takes a sword that Roald Dahl had on his wall, goes to this rich German guy in the town and beheads him because he's like, well, we're at war now. And then Dahl is having to explain to him, well, that's actually murder and you could get arrested for it. And he's like, but you said we're at war and we must try to kill them all. And Dahl is like, yeah, but not that one. It's all very confusing. 
I don't know. It was it was interesting to see, I guess. This is as well. So uh, the, up to this point, he'd been working for Shell, actually. Uh, and this is when he then goes to join the RAF. And the rest of the book is about his time in the RAF. And funnily enough, most of the notes that I've made in this were before he joined the RAF. So I, I guess I found that more in enjoyable and more interesting than the bits in the planes. But uh says here, in November 1939, when the war was two months old, I told the Shell Company that I wanted to join up and help in the fight against Buana Hitler, and they released me with their blessing. In a wonderfully magnanimous gesture, they told me that they would continue to pay my salary into the bank wherever I might happen to be in the world, and for as long as the war lasted, and I remained alive. So his, his company basically continued to pay his salary while he joined the army and went to fight Hitler. It's kind of crazy. He talks here as well about a specific invention that uh, I think they mention on QI as well. And uh, it talks about his, his aeroplane basically fires through the propellers. So it says, the Gladiator was armed with two fixed machine guns and these actually fired bullets through the revolving propeller. To me, this was about the greatest piece of magic I had ever seen in my life. I simply could not understand how two machine guns firing thousands of bullets a minute could be synchronized to fire their bullets through a propeller revolving at thousands of revs a minute without hitting the propeller blades. I was told it had something to do with a little oil pipe and that the propeller shaft communicated with the machine guns by sending pulses along the pipe. But more than that, I cannot tell you. Just kind of interesting. I like this as well. It ends with him moving to the cottage, which is in Great Missington, about two or three mi miles away from me. And it's actually really sad because there was the uh, Roald Dahl Museum there and it included his writing shed at the bottom of the garden where he used to write his books. And uh, I always meant to go and never got round to it. And there's been a flood there now, so it's closed until further notice while they, I guess, they have to raise money to do the, the repairs, which is really sad. But I'll read you the last bit of this book. I mean, it's not spoilers or anything like that. Just because this is about when he lays eyes on that cottage, I guess. We're coming into it now, he said at last. It's not much of a place, just a few cottages and a pub. I caught sight of my mother when the bus was still a hundred yards away. She was standing patiently outside the gate of the cottage, waiting for the bus to come along, and for all I knew, she had been standing there when the earlier bus had gone by an hour or two before. But what is one hour or even three hours when you have been waiting three years? I signalled the bus driver and he stopped the bus for me right outside the cottage, and I flew down the steps of the bus straight into the arms of the waiting mother. And there is a picture of the cottage. So yeah, all in all, I mean, I like this book. It's just I didn't enjoy it anywhere near as much as I enjoyed Boy, and I think I enjoyed the first half of this a, a lot more than the second half. I would still recommend it if the subjects covered in it are of interest to you, or if you are a Roald Dahl fan. I mean, I'm hopefully going to eventually get through everything that he ever wrote, so you know. And I will give this rating now, it is a 3.75 out of 5 for me. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Going Solo by Roald Dahl. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.